Let's read uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. Luke 12, 35 through 40. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Thank you. you may be seated. So is there, did you get that little thing? Scotty sent me this. I thought it was pretty funny. Pastoring. What you think I, what my friends think I do. Okay? What my mother thinks I do. The end is near. You can see that. What society thinks I do. Make lots of money. Okay? What my congregation thinks I do. Well, obviously, I don't know if you think that anymore because I've lost about 30 pounds, but then what I think I do, there's old, there's old Moses, oh, we'll walk toward the Red Sea, and then what I really do, so I don't know, it's kind of a, hopefully not, but anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. All right, great to be here today, um, a great passage of scripture for us to consider today and um, God's timing is truly amazing I have to tell you a little testimony you know I started this Sunday school curriculum to be like Jesus back in September okay and it goes for 40 weeks and the topic today of all topics on this Sunday May 1st two days before my surgery was rejoice in suffering I don't find that as an accident or, or a, just something that just happened. God is orchestrating things in my life all around me every day that, I just, that I'm just amazed, amazed at his goodness and the power of his working. And um, I, just, I just believe he's going to do some significant things in my life through this trial. He already is. He's already bringing joy to my life that I, that I probably haven't had in a long time. And um, he's given me peace and confidence and rest and strength um, for what's ahead, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, one thing you can pray for is Dr. Person. It's spelled like Pearson. He's my doctor. He's the guy that's going to uh, do the surgery and all the staff at McKinnon Hospital. And so... Um, I'm going to tell him when I see him, you know, Tuesday, you got a lot of people praying for you. So, and I hope he's encouraged by that and, and his whole staff as well. Well, how many of you this morning here are good waiters? In other words, you like standing in long lines. You like waiting in traffic. You like waiting for fast food. You like waiting for people to hit their shots on the golf course. You like waiting to see the doctor. You like waiting for test results to come back from the doctor. You like waiting for family members when they're supposed to be done for their school activities at certain times and you're, you're in the car for a while. Now, any of you that's ever been to the doctor's office, right? you know there's a place called a waiting room. And we all know how it got its name. Right? We have to wait. And I can remember one of our physicians early on in our, our family life, um, it was, I thought it was pretty funny. I walked in his office at the appointed time, and I noticed the clock was 10 minutes slow. 
I think he was telling us, get ready to wait, right? I mean, he set the clock back so that we wouldn't be all uptight because it's going to be a wait. Now, I don't know. Probably there's not too many of us here that have perfected the ability to wait, right, with any sense of patience because we live in a world where we're kind of on the, on the inside edge of, you know, instant gratification. We can get things at the snap of a finger. The point of a, a button on a computer, things come. We're, I mean, we are in a society that's so advanced technologically and intellectually that a lot of times you don't have to wait for anything. So waiting can be a very difficult thing. Yet if you're a Christian, you know that waiting is a requirement. I can remember in the book of Isaiah, the word to Israel was wait on the Lord. Wait for him. Wait for him. Israel was about to jump ahead. They were about to, to make a decision that was, that was going to hurt them. They were going to ally with a foreign nation rather than trusting in God to protect them. And they were, they were struggling with this wait for God to come through. And Isaiah comes, wait for the Lord. I say, wait for the Lord. Waiting can be difficult. We have to wait for God's timing. We have to wait for God's will to be revealed. We have to wait for God's spirit to move in the hearts and lives of our loved ones that we are still praying that they'll come to faith in Jesus Christ. We have to wait. God in, God's word tells us to wait to enjoy intimacy until we're married. And we're also encouraged to wait for eternity. Wait for eternity. There's a lot of patient waiting required to be followers of Jesus Christ. To be a good waiter in a spiritual sense requires a sense of focus, right? Spiritual focus, spiritual grounding in God's word that, that will help you as you process the time of your waiting. There needs to be prayer as you connect with your heavenly father in intimacy and joy and you uh, hear from him and you allow him to, to comfort you and guide you as you wait. And there needs to be perseverance and always in our weight as Christians, there needs to be self-denial. Self-denial. Everything just doesn't always come our way. Now, one of the things that can be difficult, when we have to wait for something for an extended period of time, is that we can lose interest, right? We can lose interest. We can get bored. We can be distracted. We can have our mind going in other places when we're called spiritually to wait for something um, or waiting for anything um, in life can create some problems for us because the longer the wait is, the more distractions that come our way and the more uh, likely it is for us to lose our focus. Our mind begins to wander. Maybe we become apathetic and indifferent while we are waiting. This morning, I want us to take a look at Luke chapter uh, 12, verses 35 through 40. We see that Jesus is addressing a very important part of his disciples' life. He is addressing his followers about a need they need to be concerned about. Something he wants them to be aware of. And the subject matter of this passage is Jesus is addressing... The stewardship of our time, how we use our time in this life, that's what he's addressing here. That's what he's concerned about for his followers. Every one of us has been allowed and allotted a certain commodity of time in this life. Every one of us. The problem is we just don't know how much that is, do we? We don't know how much time God has allotted us or allocated to us in life. And if we were to compare the allocation of our time in this life to eternity, it's not a whole lot. Even my grandma, my great-grandma, who lived to be 109 years old and 310 days, her 109 and 310 days is quite minuscule compared to eternity. And we tend to live in ways at times that says we think we're living with an unlimited commodity of time in life. 
We can live in ways that seem to indicate that we have lots of time to spare and even waste before we get serious about spiritual matters in our life or being accountable for our time before God. And if the parable of the rich fool that Jesus told prior to this passage didn't put a healthy dose of reality into the faulty notion that we have lots of time, verses 25 through 40, uh, 35 through 40 continue to drive home this important point of the stewardship of our time. See, when it comes to the steward stewardship of our time, Jesus provides us with one important statement to influence our thinking. One statement that really will help influence how we think about our time. And it's this. You find it in verse 40 when Jesus says, you must be ready. You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Jesus is saying to his disciples, always be ready. The stewardship of our time is for the purpose of remaining in constant readiness for the return of Jesus Christ. We calculate our time, we use our time, we think about our time, we allocate our time thinking about how can I, even as I do my job, even as I go to school, even as I perform the tasks of my life, even in my leisure, even in uh, all the, 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 the times of my life, how do I allocate from the perspective of preparing myself for the coming of Jesus Christ when he returns? See, as a Christian, there's only one posture to be found in when Christ returns, right? Right? That's to be ready. That's to be waiting. That's to be anticipating his coming again. Why do we, why do we need to be ready? Because we don't know the day or the hour. Uh, it's coming like a thief in the night. It will come at an hour that we don't expect. We're not thinking about it. And we know how things come awful suddenly. Things uh, kind of can blindside us in life. Uh, obviously, pancreatic cancer blindsided me just a bit. I mean, I didn't have any cancer in my family. Uh, I thought I lived a fairly healthy life, you know, uh, maybe a few extra trips to McDonald's. But other than that, you know, maybe, you know, that it, it was just going to be okay and that I would sail through. I got longevity in my life. I got a grandma who lived 109. Sometimes life just doesn't work that way when things creep up on us. And what this says is the fact that the Son of Man, that Jesus comes at an hour that we do not expect, it says we need to be ready. It says we need to guard our time. It needs to be thinking about the fact that and we don't want to be caught off guard by this because it comes out of nowhere suddenly and instantly when the Son of Man comes for the church, right? For the church, for the, for the purpose of Jesus claiming Christians out of this world or in some places in the Bible it's called the rapture, right? It will be to reward Christians for their faith. Jesus comes to reward he comes to reward their activity in the gospel work in this world. He comes to recompense or to reward or to allocate uh, spiritual eternal rewards for those who have faithfully served and given of their time in life to bless others, to be a blessing, and to shine the light of Jesus Christ in their life. Now, the day of the Lord as it's talked about in Scripture and mentioned in many places, for a Christian, for a believer, a disciple of Jesus, that might be the rapture. That might be the southern, sudden gathering of Jesus Christ of his church, right? It could be that. But the day of the Lord also could be the day of our death. When Jesus comes to take us home, where we have the confidence for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. 
For me to live as Christ and to die as gain, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once. And after this, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, 27, after this comes a judgment. Paul talks about that, this accounting of how we used our time and our life and, and what God allotted to us in life is called the judgment seat of Christ. If you're a Christian, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. We read about that in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 where Paul makes this statement, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body whether good or evil. The need to live in constant readiness is there. For it will bring about a final judgment for all believers. Jesus will assess our stewardship in life, of our time, our stewardship of the gospel, the stewardship of the things we learned and knew, the stewardship of what we did with the Bible that we owned and possessed. You see, it's really easy for people to think, well, um, I have this Bible, but it's really good to just place it on the shelf. And then, because I put it on the shelf and I really don't know what it says, that somehow I won't be accountable for what's in there. Um, that would, that's a faulty notion. If you own a Bible and you can read it, then you're accountable for what's in it, right? For what it teaches. And how much time we spend with it learning from our Lord about he wants what he wants for our lives. Jesus is going to um, give an accounting. He's going to give a grade to every one of us as believers. He's going to evaluate how did we spend our money and our, the possessions that we had. He's going he's to grade us on how we used our time. And the Bible makes it very clear in several places to give Christians ample warning to make good choices in life, to make good choices with our time as we prepare for the day that comes when we least expect it. So the challenge that that brings is, are you ready? Are you getting yourself ready? Are you thinking about that? Well, to help us this morning, Jesus provides us with four illustrations that convey the need for readiness. Four illustrations that say, get ready um, and how we can stay ready for when the Son of Man comes. And I think this is important to know because we all know that every Christian faces time wasters in life. We all face lots of things to consume our time, right? And we have to avoid these things uh, so that we can properly prepare ourselves. So, how Christians maintain a posture of spiritual readiness for the Lord's return. Number one, the robe. In your outline this morning on the screen, the robe is the readiness of alertness, right? It's being a state of preparedness to action or for action. It's staying dressed for action. Now, everyone knows that people in these days, biblical times, they wore tunics. They wore these, these kind of long flowing robes that were pretty much uh, a sack with a couple of holes for your arms and a hole for your neck, and they, they were long and draping. And they, they uh, weren't particularly, no pants, uh, no shorts, no cutoffs, and nobody would be seen in that sort of thing, um, unless you were maybe in your home with your family, but very, very relatively, they didn't wear things like that. They were always very discreet and had the long robes that were flowing. But one of the things about if you've ever worn a long robe, um, they're not the most comfortable if you have to do something very quickly, if you have to move very actively, if you, if you need to really get after something, right? And so in those days when they were called to fight, do battle, go to war, if they were involved in some kind of activity that required action, they would have to lift the corners up of their robes and get a belt, and it was called girding your loins. It was taking the, the drapiness of the robe and exposing your legs and your appendages so that you could move better. Maybe you've seen those pictures. 
They'd take up the corners of the robes, pull them in through the belt. They would shorten them up so that they could move with speed and agility. This is all very important. So what is Jesus saying in this passage? When he's saying you've got to be ready, you've got to be going, you've got to have your robe, your, your robe um, ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus, it simply means when Jesus comes, it's going to go fast. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we have to be ready to move. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Gird your minds for action. Pull in the loose ends of your life. It's a metaphor for spiritual readiness. It's a call to action for every believer to be ready and to move fast. Pull in the loose ends of your life because this is no time to live carelessly and foolishly thinking we have lots of time. That's really what Jesus is saying. Foolish and careless living just diminish our reward. It also pictures a life that's lived without entanglements. Entanglements. Things that are always tripping us up. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to look at that real quickly. Um, Hebrews 12. It, it talks about that where the, the writer of this book is um, mentioning to us in verse 1, he says, We were crowned by this, surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, things that weigh you down. He says, lay them aside. Because things that weigh you down are obstacles, right? They're, they're hindrances. They, they take a lot of your time. They waste your energy, right? He says, lay them down. Lay them aside. And then he says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely. Sin impedes our progress. It, in, it impedes our readiness. He says, get rid of those things and set before us, let us run with and race the endurance, the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? So, Jesus is saying, pull in the loose ends of your life. It's no time to live carelessly and foolishly. Foolish and careish, careless living just diminish our reward. It also, again, no entanglements. No tie-ins with this world that, that, that really just wastes our time, that keeps us away from our mission. It's a life that's not lived, not being enslaved. Enslaved. And the Lord knows how easy it is for us to enslave us, or slave our lives, because our lust, our flesh, cl craves things that enslave us, things that hold us in bondage, things that, things that own us, things that we have no power over, things that control our lives. It says, get rid of those things through the power of Jesus Christ. Cling to Jesus. He will help you loosen your life from the impediments, from the things that are holding you back. It's maintaining a life free of from obstacles or weights that hold us back of our time and ability and possessions. How many Christians today are tangled up with worldly concerns and keep themselves living in a state of, of franticness that they're not ready? They're not ready. So first we have the readiness of alertness. We're, we're keeping our lives uncluttered spiritually from all kinds of things. We're trusting, we're focused singularly on Jesus Christ. We're pulling in all the loose ends of life so that we're ready. Second, the lamp is the readiness of awareness. Carries the image of walking in the light. Walking in the light of what is true and right carries the, the idea of walking in the word. Uh, it's living my life in the direction of God's word. Now due to the suddenness of the Son of Man's coming, it is no time to be stumbling around in the dark. Stumbling around by our own counsel and our own wisdom. Stumbling around seeking the worldly guidance and worldly kind of counsel. The psalmist says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers, 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he doth meditate day and night. Why does David say that? He knows that when he meditates on God's word, when God's word is, is saturated, when, it, when he marinates in that truth, he has light, he has wisdom, he has great direction. He avoids the pitfalls and the stumbling blocks and the things that God's word shines a light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Why did he say that? Because he knows that it's very dark in this world. There's a lot of deception. There's a lot of uh, landmines that are waiting to trip up and blow our lives up with all kinds of despair, despair, defeat, entanglement, and everything else. And so we need to live in the light of revelation, the light of truth, the light of spiritual awareness. And it takes some time, it takes some focus, it takes some discipline to come under the authority of God's word and to read it and to study it. And if you can't understand it, to go to places where they like to church, you know, like to Wednesday night or wherever it is, where, where you can be in a Bible study where God's word can be revealed to you. You can understand that God loves you and has a plan for your life. But even at that, get a translation that that is understandable, and most of all, pray. God did not want to keep his word a secret from you. The devil wants you to think, oh, you'll never understand that. You know why? Because he knows when you are walking in this, you are a powerful and mighty warrior. You can see where you're going. You can see the obstacles that he set in your path to trip you up, to discourage you, to, to waste your time. That is very, extremely important. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the, the lust of the flesh. It's time to come to Christ. It's time to live godly lives. Jesus is coming. It could come at any moment. You need to be alert. You need to have the light on, right? Right? You need to be living in the light of revelation and truth, not in the light of spiritual darkness. A lamp dispels darkness. It gets rid of it. Ready Christians continue to improve and to grow in their ability to discern truth from error. And lamps keep you from stumbling. It helps a disciple to walk with great stability and confidence in their commitment to Jesus Christ. Walking with stump stability and from keeping from stumbling gives you the awareness that keeps you on the right path, the right direction, the right course. Then there's the readiness of activity. That is, that is the illustration of the servant. Jesus talks about the servant. The master finds them busy doing the work he's given them to do when he returns, when he comes for them, when he knocks at the door, they're busy. They're at it. They're prayer, prepared. They're not preoccupied. They're not distracted. They're not sort of going off on other tangents in life. They are, hey, Jesus, we're ready for you because we're serving. We're busy in your work. He says you need to be like servants who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding feast, which carries the idea you don't know when that's going to be. And so that when he immediately uh, knocks at the door... You'll be ready to open the door. It's like the door comes open. Jesus, I knew you were coming. I'm ready. It's not like Jesus is knocking in nobody's home. Jesus is knocking and no one wants to open the door because they're afraid. Maybe they've wasted their time. They didn't take his word seriously. You want to be waiting for when he comes. When he puts his hand on the door. The door is open. You're ready to receive him with gladness. You're ready to give an accounting of your life of everything. So I ask you right now, how are you serving Jesus? You were saved. Every one of us, if you're a Christian here today, you were saved to serve Jesus. How are you serving him? There's no excuses of this in life. 
You can't plead ignorance. Well, I just didn't know what I was gifted at. You need to discover that. Jesus wants you to know. And it doesn't always have to be service within the realm of the church. It could be service that you do as a Christian wherever you're at. It could be serving a neighbor. It could be serving someone else. How are you serving Jesus? That's how he wants you to be ready when he comes. That's why the, the thing you want him to say when he, when he sees you is, well done, thou good and faithful what? Servant, right? He, you want him to give you that grade. Yes, he was, a, he was a faithful servant. He served Jesus Christ. He was ready. And the thief is the readiness of anticipation. Verse 39, but know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, would he not have left his house to be broken into? You see, if you know when a thief is coming, you would make sure a thief is not going to do his devious work, right? You see, a thief, his greatest weapon is what? The element of surprise, is it not? The element of surprise, when you least expect it. I mean, no thief is very successful who comes when you expect it. When he sends you an email, I'm coming to rob you tonight. Right? They thrive on coming when you're not ready, when you're not anticipating it, when you're deep in slumber, when you've been an anesthetized by the world so much that you're lost in it, that you're in a slumber and a sleep, that you get caught off guard. Jesus says he's going to come like a thief. He's not going to come to do damage. He's not going to take to come to take something from us that he's not entitled to. But it all is the element of surprise, isn't it? The element of surprise is carried in this metaphor. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. You yourselves full know full well the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Just like a thief in the night. But you, brethren, you're not in the darkness. That that day should take overtake you like a thief. When you're walking in the, the, the light of awareness of the truth, that day doesn't surprise you. It doesn't catch you. You're anticipating it. You're ready for it. Because you are sons of light and sons of the day. So you're ready. You have your lamps on, right? You're walking and living in the truth. You are a truth seeker. You are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You want to know what God's truth is. That is a passion in your life. And that is something the Holy Spirit has to ignite with great fervor in your life. A passion to be led by the lamp, the light, the truth, the revelation of God in Jesus Christ through his word. I can't do that. I could scream to the high heavens. I could jump up and down. But tomorrow morning, to this afternoon, whatever it is, your, the, the, the motivation, the strength, and the, the desire, the hunger has to be there to say, I want my life to be lived with the lights on so I can see where I'm going. And this is how the lights get turned on. Right? We're walking in the truth. You have your loins girded, right? You're free of worldly obstacles and entanglements and distractions. You have set your heart in your life. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. You've rendered service to your master. You're active serving Jesus where he calls you, where he's put you, where he's placed you in life. You're giving. You're involved in ministry using the gifts that God has given you to preach the gospel, to share the gospel with others. You're ready to go. You're ready for him. Because he's coming like a thief. So I ask you this morning, because this is a question I have to ask myself, because they're going to put me out. You know, I have to go to surgery. I have to trust, that, you know, that I'm going to wake up from this. Well, it'll either be here or it'll be there. The 
question is, am I ready? Am I ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to give an account of your life to Jesus? Now hearing that goes, oh no, pastor, you don't know. Mm, I've squandered a lot of my life away. Is there any hope for me? And I say, of course there is. The thief on the cross in the 11th hour said, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus had you here today to hear this, to, to remind you and encourage you, start today. Start getting yourself ready today. How do you do that? The first thing to preparing yourself for Jesus' coming is to surrender your life to Jesus to be your Savior. So that when He comes, He's coming for you. Because Jesus isn't coming for everyone. Jesus has only coming for those who acknowledge Him with their mouth, confess Him as Christ, and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead. Do you unequivocally believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe you're a sinner? And without a Savior, Jesus Christ, your life is in a world of hurt when it comes to death because you don't have an answer for death because you can't save yourself. You say, how do I prepare? You humbly bow and say, Jesus, I've sinned. I acknowledge that sin and I believe in you. I trust that your death, that you offered at your life and death on the cross for my sins paid for all my sins. I'm only saved through you, Jesus, and I'm trusting in you by faith to receive me. You pray with that heart, and Jesus says you will be saved. You're on the first step ready for your future when Jesus comes. Christian, are you ready today? This sermon used to be titled, Living on Borrowed Time. We're all living on borrowed time. We don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return or our death. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Is your robe ready? Are you walking in the light of revelation? Is the lamp on? Are you serving? When he comes like a thief, will you be waiting for him? Will you welcome him? Will you welcome your Savior to your arms? Just want us to bow for a moment. Close our eyes. Lord Jesus, you love us. You died for us. We're going to remember that here, right, in a couple minutes. That you died for us, that you gave your life, you sacrificed, you were beaten, you were, you were, you were insulted, you were scourged. You were oppressed. You gave your perfect, sinless life so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have hope in this life beyond the grave. You conquered sin in the grave. You, you defeated it by going and taking the wrath of God on all our sins in your body so that we could be given your perfect righteousness through faith in you. Oh, Jesus, we are indebted to you as a Savior. But Lord, sometimes our, our faith is real weak and it shows in how we live. Our faith needs to be stronger today. To trust you enough to give our lives to you. To trust you enough to walk with you. To trust you enough to say, we want to be ready. We want to be prepared. We know you're coming. 
That's just not a myth. That's just not somebody made that up. We believe that with all of our heart, and that's going to impact our readiness. And I pray that no one here in this room would leave without a personal relationship with you, O God, through Jesus Christ, that they would reach out to you, Jesus, today to be saved. And I pray that no person would leave here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, not aware of being prepared for your coming again. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name.